Hey, what's going on, Super Simps, and welcome back to another episode of Simply Pod Logical, a Simply Not Logical podcast. You're supposed to say, hey, what's up, Hollow? Hey, what's up, Hollow? I can say whatever I want. No, you're fired. <laughs> you can intro the podcast, you know. I like when you intro. You're the star of the show. Yeah, but I'm shy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Christine, today we're talking about a new trend. You may have noticed that there have been a lot of articles lately about YouTubers behaving badly. Sounds like a TV show. Yeah, that, that could be a segment on this podcast, YouTubers, YouTubers behaving behave. badly. It's not a trend we want to participate in. And, uh, you know, you can judge these individual articles on their merits, but essentially what we're talking about is a lot of the biggest creators in the world, YouTubers, there have been articles published in Insider and the New York Times about them, like David Dobrik, James Charles, Mr. Joffrey Beast. Star, Mr. Beast. And, you know, like some of them are more serious than others. There's allegations of, you know... Uh, like uh, like violations of employment law or, you know, mistreating employees, exploiting fans, uh, allegations of sexual assault. So like there's definitely varying degrees of seriousness we're talking about here. So it's mm -hmm. kind of difficult to lump them all into a basket. Mm -hmm. But I think like my gut reaction and what I notice about all of them is that the journalists writing these pieces seem to really know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, that might seem obvious and like a very low expectation, but it's kind of based on experience in this space, right? So, Christine, you've been popular on YouTube since... Since Polish Mountain. Since 2016, I want to say. When the very first article uh, in traditional media was written about me. <laughs> that, there were articles Girl about... puts a hundred layers of nail polish on her nails. Yeah, yeah. dumb lady paints nails <laughs> too much. <laughs> Which is fine. I mean, that, you know. Whatever. You don't expect. It was dumb. So, like. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess the point is, like, YouTubers of your generation and anyone who's been on YouTube for a long time, the perception is that traditional media has not fairly covered social media or, or mm. not even fair. It's more just like. They don't understand They don't it. understand social media. Yeah. And right. I, I definitely think we've seen a shift because I remember 10 years ago, whenever articles um, like that I would read or even on the news, you'd hear about it. Uh, anyone who was an online influencer, although that word wasn't really used because mm -hmm. it wasn't well defined a decade ago, um, even though those careers were happening or beginning at that time. Sure. The people in those positions, like the influencers of that time, were rarely presented positively, and they were definitely not taken seriously as, like, business people. It was always very, like, look at this person, does dumb makeup hacks, somehow they're rich. Yeah, How isn't is that, that crazy? Fair? They don't deserve that. They make that. more than doctors. Like, yeah that, yeah, that was the narrative. But it was also a reflection of what the average person, like, in society thought mm. of influencers at that time. So it's kind of cyclical. And I mean, you could make the argument that the media paints a picture that then uh, the, the lay person absorbs and agrees with, but then also the media is kind of just saying what the lay person population thinks to be true. So it's kind of a circle. It's a bit of a chicken and egg. Chicken and problem, egg, yeah. A tautology. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I just want to be clear, though. It's not like people like you or I or other creators we know in this space have an issue with journalists like having negative stories about YouTubers when the facts warrant a negative story, right? Like, remember when Logan Paul did his Japan videos and he was just an asshole in general, but, but did something pretty awful and that had negative implications for everyone on the platform. It totally made sense that that got coverage. There was certainly frustration that like, okay, the media is going to cover a YouTuber doing a terrible thing and ignore when YouTubers do positive things. But that's just sort of a broader problem with, you know, media publications know people are going to be clicking on negative things. I think the more core point, though, was you would see articles written by journalists in mainstream publications who clearly had, like, such a poor understanding of, of the space. And what you see now from this new generation of journalists is clearly at least an understanding of, like, the business mm -hmm. implications of what it means to be a big YouTuber, right? I think the stories are still overwhelmingly negative and we see a lot of that and i think that's the debate that could still be had but clearly these reporters are 
reporting from a more educated place of at least understanding the space. They're doing their, their research, whereas I think 10 years ago, the reporters just didn't think it was worth the research almost to investigate like how this person is operating as a business and how it's a meaning, like how they're, they're an entrepreneur basically. Whereas nowadays, and maybe it's just a shift of generations, the, yeah. re the reporters reporting on YouTubers these days are very similar in age to YouTubers or just a little bit older and they grew up in digital media so they understand it so they can help explain to the audience like why this is relevant. They understand the impact also that influencers have. And I think that's what's really important and why there should be journalism, like good journalism about YouTubers that is based in facts rather than for gossip purposes. That's just my my perspective. Sure. I, I agree with journalism that is based in facts. <laughs> so when that is the case, it is important to kind of illuminate what's going on because otherwise the fan bases of YouTubers who have millions of subscribers, how are they to know that maybe who they love has done something that should be questioned? Mm -hmm. Because they're, they're not gonna know that if they don't see that anywhere in the media. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I guess, so just to your first point there, so I think the big difference is just we're talking about journalists now who grew up on social media. So I think mm -hmm. there's naturally they are going to have that understanding. I think the question that still remains in the debate, you still see when these articles come out that are exposés or whatever you want to call them, is you'll still see these sort of debates about uh, whether or not they are hit pieces, mm. which is basically a way of saying like it is coming from a a false or misleading perspective to just be unnecessarily negative, right? And it makes sense because these articles are being written by about people with millions of followers and subscribers and people who like and support them. So it makes sense that there's going to be a lot of backlash on the reporters writing these stories. Mm -hmm. And I think there is at least some space for a legitimate debate about the extent to which these articles are a good thing in that they're holding creators accountable who are exploiting their fans or exploiting employees. But I think it's, it is reasonable still to question the extent to which these articles are motivated by the knowledge that these stories are popular. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are going to click on them. We're writing stories about celebrities, celebrities to young people. And maybe that's going to get a lot of people to pay $5 a month to see Insider's articles so they can read the next story about David Dobrik, right? So I think there's still a questioning of motives happening here that is a legitimate debate as well. So I want to pull us to two specific articles that I think do a good job of sort of pulling these strings and having this debate. Uh, and the first one is an article about Mr. Beast in the New York Times written by Taylor Lorenz. So the headline is Mr. Beast YouTube star wants to take over the business world. Jimmy Donaldson 22 is out to become the Elon Musk of online creators. <laughs> a pretty uh, bizarre headline, but I, I guess the framing of it is so it's Jim aspirational. Sure, <laughs> Yeah. So Jimmy, I, we'll just call him Mr. Beast. That's how most people know him. And most people know Mr. Beast as the guy who, uh, who makes videos about giving away money or things, mm -hmm. right? I think that's fair. And they, they describe it in the article as stunt philanthropy. I think prior to that, he was making, he was trying to get like popularity on YouTube and he had kind of like shifted around a bunch of different genres. I first remember him. I wonder if you feel the same way. He, he made a bunch of videos back in the day of like, I counted to 100,000 out loud and the video would yeah. be like 24 hours long didn't he say logan paul's name like a yeah i said times. logan paul's name a hundred thousand times i watched this <laughs> video for 24 hours straight, straight on a loop yeah. it was all like pretty like ocd driven just like the the absurdity of like the number was what was yeah. drawing people in i really think that sort of preceded him being known as the guy just giving away money to people but anyway, so the frame of the article is this idea that he wants to be the Elon Musk. And I guess what that means, it's, it's based on something he tweeted a while ago, which is clearly he's not happy just being a YouTuber, getting a lot of views on videos and making a lot of money from AdSense. He wants to be a more sort of prolific entrepreneurial business person. Mm -hmm. So he, you know, runs a ghost kitchen. There's like, you can order beast burgers in North America. Uh, I think he has his own cryptocurrency. He has his own app. He's invested in a bunch of different things and businesses. And 
he's on pace to be the most popular YouTuber in the world. And I've heard him himself, like on interviews with other, other, um, like, uh, YouTube podcasts and so on, say things like he doesn't really care. Like in his, his, in his words, he doesn't care about the money he makes unless he can do something with it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of his perspective of why he's trying to grow all of these businesses because his goal is to make as much money as possible to reinvest in the channel, but then also be able to donate or do something like t to do good with the profits. That's yeah. what his statement about what his yeah, work is Yeah, he's been pretty for, explicit yeah. that his goal is to make a bunch of money so he can give it away. Basically. And it seems like he's in this loop here. And there's all sorts of interesting tax uh, questions yeah. <laughs> about his ability to write off some of these videos that I'm sure he has a team of accountants I'm at sure this point, right? I'm sure you just wake up at night thinking I about, think about Mr. Mr. Beast's, Mr. Beast's taxes. taxes all the time. I swear, I'm not even <laughs> kidding. I would love to speak to his accountant. But anyway, so th that's sort of the framing of the article. It sort of positions him as this guy. And then halfway through, it takes a pretty sharp turn. And it's uh, substantively about his, his businesses and his uh, place of business. And uh, the reporting is that uh, a number of people have come forward and spoke to the, the journalist, Taylor Lorenz, that he created a a toxic workplace where there was a lot of favoritism and inappropriate conduct, let's say. So they spoke to a number of people, but they only really focus on specific anecdotes from two of them. One of them is an editor who showed up there and worked for a week and just said the expectations were unreasonable and it wasn't a good work environment, so I left. And that guy made a video saying it was a bad experience and a lot of Mr. Beast fans uh, sent him, you know, her, her basically harassed mm -hmm. him for publicly talking about that. Uh, the other example they go into a little more depth was an editor who suggested Mr. Beast was uh, never happy with his work, would use inappropriate language to basically call him stupid. He would use the R, mm -hmm. R word slur for people with mental disabilities uh, and that there was a lot of favoritism and like that person wasn't ever being featured in videos or acknowledged or anything like that. Uh, but like, I just, I want to be clear here that like they focus on the stories from those two people, but clearly the reporting is based off having talked to more people that worked there. I think that's an important point because essentially what we saw in the reaction to this article was a lot of people and a lot of Mr. Beast fans call this a hit piece. Yeah. I've only given a very sort of quick summary of it. You're welcome to go uh, read it yourself. But I think that's sort of like the first question for us about whether it's reasonable to label this a hit piece, what it means for something to be a hit piece. I think a lot you know. of YouTubers in particular had that reflex to be like, how dare you talk about Mr. Beast in that sense? <laughs> you know, it's a little bit of a protectionist because we are a community that does get a lot of negative press um, just for being a YouTuber. Like He is a YouTuber that has a lot of, sorry to interrupt you, but he yes. is a YouTuber that has a lot of goodwill in the community too. Yes. He is seen as like a positive figure and as if, well. So yes, exactly why. So no one in the YouTube sphere wants to see him being taken down because yeah. he's done a lot of good. So it hurts us, <laughs> you know, like a, in some weird like family way to, to see that happen. Yeah. So of course we don't want that. Um, and I understand the reflex to mm -hmm. think that, whether you're a direct fan of his or you just, you know, you like the YouTube community to feel like someone who has done a lot of good is now being uh, picked at for very particular, like, uh, smaller things that aren't as illuminated. That being said, I don't think that means you can just, d you should not just discredit these claims because you like a YouTuber yeah. or because you think that they've done so much good that it means it's impossible that they've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. So I, I always read these articles carefully. I often will look at the source and, you know, you make your own judgment based on the facts of the case. Sometimes with these stories, even though the reporters are doing their due diligence as they should to investigate and talk to sources and find as much uh, like factual evidence as they can present, sometimes it still comes down to a 
well, this person just said this happened. Mm -hmm. And you kind of just have to use your best judgment as a fan, if you are a fan or not, and decide if this changes your perception of this person. And I think it's case by case, and it's hard to say, case by case, what am I, a lawyer? (laughs) But like truly, in my opinion, that's how I decide to judge creators. I also judge people based on their history. I think something important that I think a lot of people reacting to the article won't, wouldn't necessarily understand is that if the New York Times is publishing something, mm. they have an editorial process where it, it's not like they just like take some random tip and don't fact check it and put it in like the biggest newspaper in the world. You but, know what I but mean? But fact checking is asking this person, did this happen? And this person mm-hmm. says, yes, here's a video I posted in 2019. How do you know that that like this yeah, isn't but, a court of law where it's like proven? But we're not talking about one or two people. Like the the reporting that you I guess would have to trust that was actually done uh, well and mm-hmm. ethically suggests that a, a good number of people came forward. Yeah, suggesting that it was a toxic workplace. And I, my perspective, I don't question the authenticity of the reporting. I think calling something a hit piece is actually a pretty serious thing to say about it, right? Because I think you're basically implying that the journalist, uh, you know, doesn't have that sort of ethical standard and instead was just printing like an overly, uh, like a, uh, like a false negative story almost. Like a hit Mm. piece to me almost implies you're saying like, Like it's it's not a credible story. Not just unfairly negative, but just like misleadingly negative. Yeah. Because I actually think the, uh, I think a fair criticism of the article is that in a few aspects, I think it is overly or unnecessarily negative in a specific way, but not in a way, to me, that refutes that Mr. Beast's workplace probably is a little bro-y and shows favoritism. Because he's mostly hired, he's like a 22-year-old YouTuber making millions of dollars who has mostly hired his friends and family. I have no trouble believing that that's not necessarily the most professional workplace, right? I, I would agree with you. And yeah. just to be clear, like I I believe when someone says that they were mistreated, <laughs> that they yeah. were, that they felt that way for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, he's 22 now, but he got big when he was 20. How does a 20, like there's, there's plenty of people who are 20 years old listening to this. Can you imagine all of a sudden like skyrocketing to fame, having millions of dollars and then having a team of like 12, 15, 20 of your friends and you have to, you boss them around, basically. And that's putting mm-hmm. it a little too, you know what I mean? <laughs> but like you tell them what to do and you pay them. How do you manage to do that as a 20 year old when you yourself may not have ever had the experience of having a boss in a traditional sense because you were too young to ever get to that stage in your life? I mean, maybe you had a, a job at Subway. I don't maybe. know, I'm just making that up, like, you know, in high school. Mm-hmm. But that's not really the same as when adults traditionally will get a job they have a supervisor and a manager and like you kind of understand the relationship there Mm -hmm. um and when you have that relationship experience you then know how to be a supervisor or manager to others but to be thrust into that position without having that experience of ever having been managed Mm -hmm. or having your own managerial experience or training training to be a supervisor right yeah like it, yeah, I I yeah, the, absolutely believe that there are things were not done uh, pro- as properly as they could have been. Yeah, sure. And yeah, I don't think anyone would be surprised by that. I think, so I, I implied the, or I said the article I thought was unnecessarily negative in a few places. I think it would be unfair of me just to gloss that over and not explain why. I think one aspect is uh, it describes him as a stunt philanthropist. And, you know, it's kind of what we were getting at. A lot of his videos, a lot of what made him popular were these videos about him just sort of giving away money. I think the article, like, kind of strongly implied, you know, he gives away money, but he makes a ton of money from AdSense and sponsorships. So it's like, it's not really like he's giving the money away. He's making all that money. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a pretty uncharitable way of framing what he's doing. Because the guy is literally giving, like, millions of dollars to food banks. He has a whole separate channel for philanthropy. Yes, he is making a lot of money, but I know a lot of people who make a lot of money on the internet and they're not donating it to mm-hmm. charities. Right. So I feel like it was a pretty uncharitable way of sort of framing his philanthropic 
angle to his content. Yeah, like, can you give him some credit for <laughs> the yeah. amount of good he's It's not saying this article to needs do. to be positive, but I just found, like, the sort of description of that sort of made it seem like it wasn't... And, and, and here's the thing. There is some gray area here, too, because for a long time there was popular content on YouTube that was, like, people walking up to homeless people, giving them $100, hmm. filming their happy reaction... And then they'll upload that to the internet and make, make way more money than $100, right? Yeah. And there's something clearly exploitative about yes. that. So I'm, I'm not like saying there isn't a problem with that kind of content, but I, I think he is not an example of that in my mind anyway. And so maybe the argument is that sometimes news media will use just the, the hottest YouTuber at the time and try and take a little bit of a more negative twist because that YouTuber's name is just so clickable right now. And it's no different than what we have what we see with celebrities in the past three decades, four decades, right? Yeah. Whoever's uh, popular. Yeah. I, I guess one other aspect of the article I think is worth at least acknowledging, because I'm curious to see what you think of this. Uh, they seem to be blaming Jimmy, Mr. Beast, for the fact that his fans... Uh, harassed the former employee who made a public video about having had a bad experience working for him. Mm. And I, I think not a lot of people would necessarily think of how to put themselves in this position, but it just seemed a little unfair to me. I'm not sure if I'm looking at this the right way, but just, you know, Mr. Beast isn't, you know, a father to his fans. I Like, I think some creators cultivate... Um, different fan bases and some of them are more positive than others but when you are someone with like millions tens of millions of followers and someone makes a public statement uh, that puts you in a negative light a small percentage of those fans are going to mm -hmm. harass or speak out for you and that's not really within your control right uh yeah I, I agree, but I also think, I think there's a bit of a balance and it's not as black and white. I think that as a creator, you kind of foster your fan base and their mm -hmm. attitudes. So if you are generally a positive person who isn't gossiping or encouraging, you know, putting other people down, then your fans will generally be positive. That being said, even if you do all that correctly and you're a good human and what you tweet and you're not like, you know, rude to others... There's going to be people who go in to defend you, even if you deserve it, <laughs> whatever. that Like, sure. say there is a, a negative article about you because you actually fucked up. Yeah. There will still be fans that go and defend you and, you know, start being really awful and send death threats to the person who made the, the takedown piece, even if the takedown piece is accurate. Yeah. Because there are just fan bases, no matter of which creator they, they are born from, are so passionate and sometimes they are they can be willfully blind to their creator's own behavior and decisions and they just will refuse to believe that their beloved idol could have done anything wrong yeah. and it's not like the creator is directly asking them to go and defend and the creator shouldn't have to say don't do this or do this mm -hmm. sometimes there's just children on the internet who are yeah. going to say whatever they feel like and I don't think creators with millions of followers can control them or have a responsibility to follow up to each comment. And yeah, and I know. think just a big part of it's just the numbers we're talking about. If you have this number, if you yeah. have twenty million followers, even like you know at least a hundred of them are going to be complete assholes who are sending people yeah. death threats and things like, online. This is just the internet. It's not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just the internet. Yeah, I don't think we have to convince uh, female journalists that they that harassment on the internet is a, just a natural thing. But I just, I found yeah. that article of that aspect of the article again just a little bit like, is this just a little unnecessarily negative to frame it in this way? Mm -hmm. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I'm looking at this article and I'm thinking, yeah, he probably does have a pretty unprofessional workplace based off the substance of this reporting. Yeah, based off his his age and experience, he doesn't have HR. I don't think at this well, point. This is an ex age isn't an excuse, right? I, I guess no, you have to it, be. Sorry, it's not an excuse, but it provides context. Yes. To be a twenty year old thrust into the spotlight with millions of dollars, and now you have all these employees, and you don't have experience of having 
a manager and some kind of corporate structure because you don't have that job experience. Mm-hmm. I how how does one expect you to know how to operate? That being said, I do expect people in that position to do some research and hire people who know what to yeah, do and exactly. can help them make those decisions and do it properly. Yeah, I think that's totally the reasonable take. But uh, it, like even ultimately, like I, I guess the article got sort of a weird response too because even the examples of the toxic workplace, the sort of anecdotes and examples that were included, not to dismini- diminish their seriousness, I think a lot of people didn't necessarily find them the most compelling or serious even, you know, like uh, I expected, he expected too much of an editor. He was a perfectionist and he fired him after a week or the guy quit after a week. Like that's not necessarily a great or a uh, bombshell example of a toxic yeah. workplace. You know what I mean? So I think that's another reason people like, just hasn't, felt this. Hasn't everyone who's ever had a boss has had an experience like that? I'm not saying it's right, but like mm-hmm. I've definitely had. I think it's more like had the, bosses who had unreasonable expectations. Yeah, it's maybe more like the <laughs> language he's using and the sort yeah. of favoritism. But again, the favoritism is like he's hired a bunch of his friends of his to friends. feature in videos, and yeah, they were incredibly young using words that they thought were cool or funny and are not. Mm-hmm. So. These aren't excuses, but they they make sense in a way. Like, I'm not surprised, I guess is what I'm mm-hmm. saying. Yeah. Anyway, if I could compare this and uh, transition here, mm-hmm. Christine, to another article that I actually think kind of pulls at the same string, uh, but I actually think is a, a much more sort of direct and I thought more compelling uh, case of this. They're, they're related in the sense that they're really both about employment law more than anything else in a weird way, which is... There's this other article in uh, Insider, uh, a journalist is Kat Tenbarge, and it's about James Charles and the fact that a former employee of his is suing him right now. And this has been the case for a while, right? I think it's just that this lawsuit is only coming to light recently because the the plaintiff has made it public, but I believe the case has been in process for years. Like yeah, I think years. it's been at least two years. So this is someone who worked from him for him uh, while he uh, really made a big jump in terms of his success on mm-hmm. the platform. I think he jumped from like two to seven million subscribers during the time she worked for him. Uh, a lot of the reaction to the story online has sort of pulled out the more like salacious details of the story, which includes, uh, you know, she alleges that he uses the N-word very casually. Uh, she suggests that he asked her to shave his ass at one point. And she just paints a picture of a, of a very sort of uh, uh, baby boss, like juvenile boss, unprofessional, unpro- unorganized work environment, almost in a way where I think she's sort of painting a picture of, you know, if I hadn't been around helping him produce and edit videos he may have not had the same success. That's clearly like the case she is trying to make from a wrongful termination perspective. Well, yeah. the things you you just said aren't even necessarily like part of the lawsuit. The lawsuit is about wrongful termination and failure to pay wages, right? And yes. is that it? I, th- I feel well, yeah, like so there was a few, I, I, <laughs> we are not lawyers, but- <laughs> Yeah, um, disclaimer. <laughs> but there is a legal, um, exactly. there is a Sorry, suit yeah. against him. Where I was going with that is like, uh, people pulled out these sort of very specific details, but mm-hmm. I think, yeah, her argument is that she made a significant contribution. She's suggesting she wasn't compensated for overtime. Mm-hmm. And she is alleging like the, the, the substance of the case is really wrongful termination. And that is that uh, she, her and James went to get their nails done together. She uh, passed out from the fumes or something and injured her head. And he was there and saw this happen. And I guess he very quickly, after it was difficult for her to work, like right after this happened, he just you know, terminated her contract with him, mm-hmm. uh, you know in a way that she is alleging is illegal under California law. Mm -hmm. So that's where the case is right now. I guess what's kind of interesting about this one is, so you're right, this litigation has been going on for a while and there's lots of complex legal reasons why it's taking so long. Uh, You could check out a lawyer on YouTube if you want to learn more about that. What's the, who's that? Emily D. Baker. Yeah, she's covered this one too, right? She covers it very well. 
Yeah. And she's actually a licensed attorney and has knowledge. She's not she, there to give legal advice no. for you or James Charles. <laughs> You're making the disclaimer for her. No, I'm just, <laughs> I feel like I watch so much of her content that I know. Yeah. But um, she does a really good job of accounting it from the legal perspective and like what are the facts. And I think that's what's important here is like what are the facts that are being alleged and that the court has like accepted and is moving forward. And that's where all of our opinions should be based on is facts, not just gossip, not just what a tweet says, not mm -hmm. just what, what James Charles says in his Twitter video. Mm -hmm. Facts. Yes. So her, her channel is excellent. Shout yeah. out to her. Uh, I love that she goes directly. Like she'll pull pull the the docket. She'll, she's looking at court at filings document, and yeah. documents, right? Which is, this is a bit of a tangent, but I do want to touch on something because I, I don't want this, anything we say in this episode to be perceived as us being like anti-journalist or against journalism covering cases like these. I'm, I'm totally supportive of it. And one thing that I think gets forgotten in the YouTube space sometimes is there's a lot of YouTubers who cover news, but they're not actually doing journalism. And what I mean by that is... Uh, they're not doing like the sort of primary journalism that actually reveals a story in the first place. Mm, so secondary. like they're basically aggregating news stories, which I think is is great. There's a lot of people I watch and curating. like and are, who are doing a good job. And yeah, basically what they're doing is curating news stories that were created by other people. But I would really encourage people who consume their news that way to consider that someone in the first place had to be on the ground, walking into a courtroom, showing up at City Hall to question, you know, your local politicians, that sort of primary journalism is essential and mm -hmm. fundamental to these stories getting to the point at which news aggregators can talk to them. And that's a good lesson across the board, even if you're, if you're a student just writing a research article. Look up multiple sources to support your argument, right? So whenever I'm watching a news story that I'm not sure if, like, are these all facts or did this get lost in translation, I look for the source and then I look for more sources related to the same topic. And I feel like that's just training that's been ingrained in my brain since school. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that's a, a, something we should all be doing no matter what, whenever we're presented with a story from any news media publication. Yeah. And this also ties into the argument, like some people have dismissed these stories about YouTubers because, you know, the suggestion is that they're just doing it to get clicks to make money. I think like, you know, maybe I think, both are true. Exactly. Both <laughs> these things can be true for sure. But I just want to again, point out that journalism isn't free reporters have to you know make money and eat food to live like the idea that something being behind a paywall is used to like dismiss the integrity of the reporting i think is really unfair and i think that good journalism is worth paying for and i think you can believe that at the same time you can question if sometimes these articles are being written because an editor or a media company knows mm -hmm. that writing salacious stories about YouTubers is more likely to generate revenue in to that get way. Them so again, it's another these both both these things can be true. Yeah. Yeah. Back to the James Charles thing. Uh, what's interesting is he's sort of obviously he was asked for comment. He was asked to comment on this story, and the reporter would have shared with him some of the claims that were being made by the. Uh, the claimant and uh, the, plaint. the plaintiff. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just making up words at this point. But yeah, so he he made the decision to come on social media to try to get ahead of the story, mm -hmm. which was maybe a terrible idea because it might have just brought a lot more attention to it. Yeah, but I think he believes it was a smart idea because his his fans, as we were just speaking earlier, fan bases are incredibly powerful. Uh, haven't seen him for a couple weeks. So they're kind of just sitting there waiting for their their idol to come back, show his presence. And when he did, I'm assuming his fans all got incredibly excited. Actually, if you look under his tweet, there's so many messages of support. Good to see you back. Mm -hmm. We're here for you. We'll fight for you kind of messaging. And by doing that, it's like he rounded up his cattle again. Like they're ready to fight for him in the comments. And I, <laughs> I don't, I don't think, well, that, that's kind of what it's like. His, sheep? <laughs> it's, it's, there's a lot of willful blindness among his Absolutely. fan base. There's a lot of willful blindness among fan bases of anyone. 
villain. Yeah. It's it's not unique to just him. But I think he did this maybe in part because it just felt like it's getting something off his chest directly. So he's speaking from himself. And it is frustrating to feel like you're silenced in pending litigation. That can be really frustrating, especially if you like to talk a lot and want to like get things out there. <laughs> Very quickly. But then also it's strategic because it 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 tells his fans, you're going to hear something bad about me, mm. but but don't listen. Okay. Yeah. Don't listen. So I mean, I knew exactly what he was doing, but his fans don't necessarily see that. Right. And it, yeah, I think it certainly was strategic. I think the the person suing him has received a lot of negative. Has been harassed by his, by fans, his fans since he, as expected. Like. Yeah, and I don't yeah. think we can gloss over the fact. Not that I want to get into this too much, but you know, you implied he's been sort of quiet on social media for a while. So this was him sort of coming back. The important context here is that he's been away from social media for a while because of credible accusations of him uh, being sexually inappropriate with underage boys. Mm -hmm. So like, it's not just he was taking a break from the internet. Mm -hmm. And he almost was trying to use this as like a way to make people feel sorry for him because it's like, oh, this person is going public with this story now because uh, the court of public opinion isn't in my favor. And I'm sitting here watching this, yeah. like, like there's credible allegations. You're a sexual predator. Like, is the court of public of public opinion not in your favor just because people don't like you, or is it because I mean, there's I mean, it, been it, serious? It can also yeah. be true that this person was motivated to go public at a time where maybe she was less likely to receive a lot of backlash from his fans because maybe, you mm -hmm. know, given the current context, but. And and to be fair, though, be, just to balance it, in the article, the, the journalist does ask about the fact that the plaintiff had previously gone through a court case with another influencer. Mm -hmm. So they had worked previously as a video or producer, I can't remember, for Erica Costell, yeah. um, who is known for Being dating Jake, Jake Paul. Paul. <laughs> I think yeah, so. Yeah. Um, Good and group she, of people. She had her own career uh, outside of that. But... Uh, from what I understand, although I didn't look at the court documents myself, but I've heard that the plaintiff did win her case for uh, something to do with em employment. Like I, th I think they settled, they, and that's they why settled, they can't sorry. talk about they, it. You're right. They settled, so that's why they can't talk about it. But the to the um, journalist's credit, they did ask, so you've... So you've sued an influencer before. What's up with that? And yeah. I think that's a fair question it's to ask. It's totally a fair question. And the response from the, the plaintiff, the person interviewed, was was very interesting. And I found it like made a lot of sense. And she said something to the effect of, you'd be surprised at how much mistreatment there is among influencers who hire people to help them out. Because this is such an unregulated new industry. And our employers don't know what the fuck they're doing basically because they're new they're young they're incredibly rich and they don't have like hr teams yeah. so or experience um, working in workplaces where there are sort of established processes they don't have experience being managed so how can they be a good manager or supervisor to others yeah i think maybe this is the real question to pull away from both these articles is that YouTubers don't know how to be bosses and don't know the legal implications not, of not having employees. Not all YouTubers, because of course, they're, like we even know some YouTubers who've done a great job at building teams and who are respectful employers. So mm. not not all YouTubers. Not We're not going to blanket YouTubers. our own people after we just said that the media blankets our people. But uh, <laughs> but it seems like it's a thing. And the, the trend is that it's younger YouTubers who skyrocketed to fame very quickly. Yeah, yeah. I, I would not be surprised at all if we hear about more lawsuits in the future from assistants, editors, producers mm -hmm. who were just unfairly treated, who made giant contributions to the success of influencers and were not well compensated or were terminated or are just alleging toxic, unprofessional workplaces. Yeah. I, that would not surprise me at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, people talk about cancel culture, but like, how is James Charles still? <laughs> people know how we feel about this, right? Like, I, I don't get how anyone or any company is supporting this guy at this point. I think people have suspected that we've had a bias against James Charles <laughs> for the last few years. That's yeah. because in our education video, I think a few years ago, 
I was basically uh, making fun of him for dismissing education. I don't think he liked that. And I don't think his fans liked that of me. Um, mm. I stand by my opinion of him, but I think my opinion on him has definitely evolved as it seems like every couple of months there's something new that he's done, that his actions that like he tweets or that he literally does and there is no denying it, uh, have made me just increasingly be like, yep. Like, yeah, I... Like like, let's be fair. Like, he's not the only YouTuber that has ever, like, discounted the importance of education to his young fans. And I don't think that's even something he's really no, done no, no. in a very significant way. No, I, I was way. just clarifying, like, the first reason why I just personally decided I didn't like him <laughs> was because of that, honestly. <laughs> yeah. And that's just my own personal bias against YouTubers who really shut down education. And they say things to their fans that I think is really misleading and terrible advice. Like, I didn't need school to be a multimillionaire, therefore, you don't either. Fuck school. Yeah. I really hate that attitude. We've talked about that on other podcasts. So yeah, that made me not really like him. But subsequent to that, like, you know, I'm not going to make drama videos about him just because I personally dislike him for that single fact mm -hmm. that other people may not agree with. But subsequent to that, there was just so many tweets and, you know, he'd make apologies for this and that. And he insulted like Alicia Keys and then this other influencer. And it's just like, how many mistakes can you make <laughs> and yeah. still be forgiven by your fan base? I guess that's what the most surprising thing is to me, that to this day, despite so many mistakes, because I always think there you have, you have like a couple chances as an influencer to do something wrong and apologize and show change. And when you don't show change and your immaturity or whatever it is continues, mm -hmm. then I, I as, a, as a viewer... I'm not, I'm not supporting anymore. I'm but not the, into the it. bad behavior has never been reinforced with consequences for him, I think is the real thing. So like education stuff aside, I find that's like a very minor part. It of is. That and that's just like my own said. personal. Like, I know. But f for me, and I think for us, like he really embodies like a lot of the worst aspects of influencer culture. That's how I've always felt about him. And I've always felt like he's been on this sort of pedestal on YouTube, yeah. appearing in YouTube original series and being sort of a representative of this platform when I think there's a lot of signs pointing to him being not a good person. And, you know, I guess what his case proves is that if companies can still make money off of you, cancel culture doesn't really exist in those cases, right? YouTube is also a platform that profits off of him or has... Well, have they? I thought they had suspended monetization on it. Did that happen? Or was that just Dobrik? I feel like oh, okay, that there's was, been too many of these stories that, that we confuse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Like Morphe continues to carry his product because they've invested a lot of money in the manufacturing of that product. Yeah. So that that's just about money. That's just a question of money. His fans, on the other hand, it's just a question of loyalty. And because of his size, he's cultivated a giant fan base, many of which are still hanging on. I'm not su surprised by it. I feel like that's natural with any um, influencer that gets to that level of fame, especially so quickly. And I feel bad for his fans, too, because they're also maybe struggling with seeing these news articles. Other people are telling them, dude, like, you're wrong. Like, look, look at what's right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And they still feel like, Maybe James has changed their life in a positive way and they truly feel a connection with him. And so I also don't want to discount that and just be like, just forget about him. Like I sure. understand having developed a relationship, especially if you feel like they've changed your life in a positive way. Mm -hmm. It's hard to just like let go just like that. It's like breaking up with someone. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you want to talk about your experience with, in the media? With the media, <laughs> having like you've given a few interviews. Uh, Can we over put the, the podological screen back on? Oh, okay. I feel like he's you staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Do you feel better now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you've given some interviews over the years, not many, and I think you've mostly had you know positive experiences. It's not like we've ever seen an article some negative article come out about you. No, because I'm not famous enough for you're a not, negative not, article. That's right. Uh, but yeah, what, how do you feel about, you know, the times you have spoken to reporters and, you know, given, yeah. given them quotes to use in an article? 
So I've had some positive experiences and then I've also had some weird ones. Okay. I've, um, I think just, just on the surface though, like you haven't seen me do many media interviews, like TV stuff, because I've mostly declined them. And that's A, because I'm just nervous as hell and I feel like I don't do well under pressure. And this podcast, I feel just like way more safe because it's just Ben asking me questions or you guys when you send them in from the audience. So I feel comfortable. That's well, a good point. You don't, sorry to cut you off. You don't need like- You to don't have to, to give interviews. Talk yeah. to people, you don't need media, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Good point. I have my own platforms on which I post videos. I post stories on Snapchat, on Instagram or whatever. I tweet you guys. And I feel like I can speak for myself and I don't need an interviewer for press. Mm. That being said, a lot of influencers choose to do press because it it elevate, not not elevate in a positive way, but it broadens their um, their reach by yeah. having other platforms talk about them. So there is a business reason why influencers or YouTubers will do press and will go on this this uh, TV channel or this radio sure. station. And, you know, they're trying to make more people aware of them. I'm kind of the opposite. I'm like, I don't, I'm not motivated to have press talking about me. I don't feel the mm -hmm. need to do that. I just like speak from my own channels. So I have limited media experience because I've said no. But in my inbox, there's hundreds, thousands of emails that have made requests to interview me whether it was for like just a web article or uh, something on tv mm. and i've mostly declined politely because it just wasn't for me in in part because i'm nervous and shy and don't feel like i really want to but then also in part because i feel like they might have an angle they might have spoken negatively about youtubers before and it's not really something I wanted to participate in. Hmm. Uh, that being said, I have done interviews that were positive when I felt like there was a good r rapport between me and the interviewer. So like the McLean's article I did a couple yeah. years ago. And the angle they took was a uh, big YouTuber with 6 million subscribers also works as a crime statistics analyst. That's mm -hmm. interesting. And kind of a, a feel-good story. It's a feel-good story because they, they did paint it as the way I truly do see myself, which is like someone who worked really hard in school and her career to get to a certain place with the Canadian government to work in crime statistics. But I also have this creative hobby that has just ex exploded in success and has done really well. And I've done both. And uh, they saw it as a great story, especially like as a, as a woman to be able to accomplish these things in business, but also being taken serious mm -hmm. in the corporate world. And I felt like it, it was a really nice article of them to write. It was also a Canadian magazine. So they wanted to, so you assume they'd be nice. I assume they'd be or? polite. No, but it's like a feel good story about a Canadian. Like mm -hmm. that's what it was. Um, there was also like a local Ottawa one that, that took a similar angle. Then there's been some weird ones that came to me where I felt like their questions indicated that there was already a narrative they had in mind and mm. those include ones where I could tell they were angling to see if I had the experience that in my workplace I was taken less seriously perhaps because I'm a woman who does beauty stuff on the internet mm -hmm. so they're like do your male colleagues you know dismiss you in the office because you have nail videos and just I know that this must, of course this exists and women creators have had this experience sure. for sure, but it was not my personal experience. Mm -hmm. My colleagues are amazing. Shout out to my colleagues <laughs> and their families. <laughs> okay. Shout out to their families. Shout out to their families. No, um, th and that is just my my truth and my experience. And I am incredibly like lucky, grateful and happy to have that experience and proud to say that that is my experience. But mm -hmm. because it did not fit in the narrative of what that news media article, they, where they were going, uh, my responses weren't really used. Yeah. And I guess I just want to be very like fair and careful that like, mm -hmm. yeah, journalists sometimes already have like a story kind of written and they know the sort of angle of their story. And it's not to say it's like, you know, misleading or they're just trying to make you fit into a thing. They might just legitimately think you could have provided some additional context or anecdotes. I could have been supporting examples. evidence. Yeah. Because they already had a story, clearly, based on the questions they were asking me. And they were looking for more examples. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't an example that they could have used. Yeah. But I get that it's an interesting sort of peek into how articles are made sometimes when 
you can tell a journalist just by even the just even the choice of questions you are receiving mm -hmm. a lot of times kind of already hints at what the substance of the story would be another one yeah. similar to that was asking me about my mental health and how it might have gone downhill since being a youtuber uh, that has not been my experience in the way that they were describing it and in the way that they described other people who were interviewed in the article. Mm -hmm. So I, again, I didn't fit exactly what they were trying to describe. So they just didn't use much of what, what yeah, I said. You just weren't really I just featured like wasn't in, in it. that article. <laughs> yeah, I remember okay. that one too. But like, it's fine. It wasn't in, I knew it wasn't in an article about just me. So I wasn't being misrepresented. Mm -hmm. It's just because I didn't really support the narrative they already knew they were going with. I was just kind of cut. <laughs> yeah. All right, just to button things up, just so no one is confused about our perspective, I, I, we, I think I can speak for both of us. We think it is a good thing that there is a new generation of journalists who understand social media and are covering YouTubers, particularly in cases when they are, you know, lit, like when there are exploiting, facts. when they are when factually are facts. <laughs> exploiting their fans or yeah. employees or audience or whatnot. And I just, I just want to add on, sorry to interrupt. I'm sure. I think it's so important because without that kind of work, the fan bases of these giant YouTubers would have no idea. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not still continuing to be willfully blind despite these articles being out, but it really does help open the eyes of people because otherwise these things wouldn't be illuminated. Or like, who is the actual target audience of these articles? I don't think it's your average, you know, James Charles fan who is reading the New York Times necessarily, right? But maybe it's their parents, Mm -hmm. who are pulling out their credit card when that kid wants to order the next makeup palette that James Charles might release, right? Buy that merch. Buy that merch. Don't buy that merch. Don't buy that uh, merch. <laughs> apologies to Emily D. Baker. We were going to have her on, but we ran out of time. You say that, but now people are going <laughs> to be like, you should actually <laughs> we should have actually, her on. I, hey, I, I'd, I'd have her on. We should. We should get not legal advice, but legal commentary. <laughs> I love that stuff. I'm so fascinated by it. Yeah, it kind of reminds us both. I, th I think there's both, for both of us, there was a time where I think we thought we might be lawyers. I worked for lawyers. You worked for a lawyer. I thought I was going to go to law school. I almost did at one point. I worked for lawyers and got mistreated by lawyers. Got, that's right. That was the guy <laughs> who... Employment <laughs> lawsuit. No, I'm, just kidding. <laughs> I'm over it. I bet lawyer, like there's all sorts of stories about lawyers being hugely unprofessional in the workplace. The stories back in the day, right? Yep. Mm, Hello. <laughs> interesting. You think they would know employment law? Yeah, you think they wouldn't do dumb <laughs> shit, but you know, humans are humans. Maybe I that's guess. the problem. They know it too well. They know yeah, how to get away. Yeah, they know. There's no. There's like. There's no evidence. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Hey, if you want actual uh, uh, legal um, perspective on these legal, cases, legal commentary, legal, legal commentary. Perspective. Yeah, Emily Facts, B. Baker. Not fuckery. <laughs> great YouTube channel that's covered a lot, most of these sort of high-profile YouTube. Uh, cases to the extent that they have an obvious legal dimension. Yeah, anyway. and I think it's really important to pay more attention to news or media or YouTube videos that actually look for the facts. And that's what she does. She literally pulls up the court case. And because court cases aren't written in layperson words, like the Times article, mm -hmm. she will interpret them for you and be like, this is the judge saying... I ain't got time for this today. And it's really, truly helpful and useful as a lay person to understand these things. Motion to dismiss. Motion. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Yeah. Happy Taco Tuesday. Yeah. And we'll uh, see you next week. See y'all later. <laughs> Bye. Bye.